Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Ask Octopus. My name is Bob Walker, and today joining me is Ryan Russo. Hello. And Derek Campbell. Hi. Uh, before diving into our questions today, uh, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we record these videos typically a week or two in advance. Uh, if we get a question that comes through email or Slack or in our YouTube comments, you might not see an answer for a week or two. Just, just letting you know. So you're, if you're wondering, where, hey, where's the answer to my question? That's, that's the reason why. Uh, today, I'm going to kick it off, and we're going to talk a little bit about how can I run a step only when a specific step fails. So typically, this is done for, say, a notification, be it Slack or an email. Now, Derek or Ryan, uh, how have you guys handled that in the past where you wanted to notify somebody if a uh, deployment failed? Uh, I, oh, go ahead, Derek. No, I normally would use the, one of the run conditions. Okay. Yeah, there's the I'll only run if a previous step failed run condition. So usually put my notification for failure at the bottom of the process, change it to only run if something failed. Okay, yeah. And that's typically how I did it as well. Uh, but what I kind of ran into was a situation where I have these two steps at the very top, uh, get feature branch name and web admin approved deployment. Well, if the web admins don't approve that deployment, if they say, hey, abort this, it will actually come through as a failure. So my send failure notification step would even send that out if someone didn't approve it. Um, now, a tip, uh, the typical use case that I ran into uh, when I was working at a previous company was our web admins, they only wanted to get paged if a deployment would fail, uh, specifically to IIS, because they wanted to sign in and they needed to fix something or do something like that. They didn't want to be bothered if the approver didn't approve the deployment. Uh, so that's a little bit of a concern. And what would happen is we'd have someone like an angry web admin sign in because it's like, hey, I just got paged. Oh, yeah, sorry, we, we didn't approve that deployment. And they're like, oh, man, and we you know, wasted their time. You don't because, want to deal with the, the angry web admins. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this is kind of like a more interesting case for more granular control because really I only want to send this notification if this, this step really fails, the zero downtime deployments. And now this is something I didn't know is you can reference steps in variables. So if I come in here, I come to this run condition and I can click on this insert a variable. You can come in here, you can reference other steps. So you can say octopus.step. Now it doesn't show you all the different steps like you can reference it by uh, step name. But if I come into action, you can see that we do provide some, a lot of helpful tips on how to get that action. You can see we can reference almost everything about those actions. It's quite nuts. But eventually you'll get down here and you'll see octopus.action deploy to IIS enabled features. You can see all kinds of different things that we provide. Now, one of the things that we provide in these variables is you can do a run condition like an if statement. So if variable name and if that value, if, if value if true. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Now, could you do something like that with the step? And could you grab the status code? So one of the values that we provide is inside of here, you can provide a, let me expand this out just a little bit. I can reference a very specific step that says if octopus.step and then you provide it the step name, zero downtime deployments, that status code has failed. Then I can set a value like this, true, otherwise set it to false. And then what I can do is I can reference that as a variable. If I come back to my process, I click on the send failure notification. I set my run condition to only run if project.is.deployment.failed. So I only want to be notifying this team, this deployment failure team, if that occurs. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off a release. So that's only going to run if something within that rolling deployment fails. That's correct. Yep. So, and I've configured my deployment to, to fail itself. Um, I've created, I set it to a folder that doesn't exist. So it fails pretty quickly, but yeah, it allows me to do something like that where, as you can see, zero downtime deployments. And it came in here and it said, yep, this is going to run. This variable run condition is evaluated as true. So send failure notification will be running. Really nice. You have a, a very specific process here where you're only deploying to the web as if somebody had um, you know they had all of their steps within one project like I want to deploy my database I want to deploy my web UI and then maybe some uh, Windows services also 
mm-hmm. then you could actually have a different notification going to different groups depending on which steps fail. That's that's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because you might want to just notify the DBAs and maybe the the development team, hey, this this particular deployment failed at the database deployment step and then they could start investigating without even bothering everybody else. Yeah, I didn't even think about something like that, but that's a really good point. Yeah, you can make it really, really granular in terms of how you want to handle this. So, yeah, you don't want angry DBAs because they woke up because the web part failed. Exactly. That's another, <laughs> that's another really good point. So, yeah, it really helps you do something like that. Now, another example I was thinking of was uh, blue-green style deployments. Maybe you're doing uh, a deployment to green and blue is live. Well, if the deployment to green fails, maybe you want to run a PowerShell script that rips down green uh, so you don't have bad code sitting out there for no particular reason. No, that's a good use case. Very, very versatile there with the run conditions. Yeah, I thought I didn't know it existed and a a customer asked me and I was like, I wonder if that's possible. And through a little bit of trial and error, I was able to get it working. I was pretty happy. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That, how often is that actually, uh, you know, how often, how much of our time do we spend that, you know, where we, you know, people just ask, well, yeah, I'm not too sure, but, you know, uh, <laughs> got to give it a try. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how it goes for almost all these questions. And I think that's probably what drove this series, actually, was doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It's like, those are usually, of all the questions I have to choose from, it's like, well, this one was interesting because I, I learned it too, so. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's what really... Yeah, that's how I add my questions to this. Uh, and I learned something today. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Derek, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about authentication providers. So I'll stop my sharing. Thanks, Bob. Okay, so um, just want to jump into uh, some tips and tricks um, about authentication providers. Back in, um, before I worked at Octopus, I've been using Octopus, uh, similar to you guys, for the past five years now. Um, you know, back in the day, it was just local users and passwords. It was really straightforward, really easy to do. But then it was very manual. You had to email people their username and password because it wasn't like to Active Directory. It was, you know, email and username and passwords are not secure. Mm-hmm. Definitely causing some problems, um, you know, even then, but occasionally send it as an SMS, you know, real separation there. Um, <laughs> you so, know, you'll never get, yeah, yeah no one will ever grab, get, be able to grab both of those at the same time. <laughs> I've also had it where they send it in two separate emails. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There's that. so obviously, you know, with them, um, with the newer versions, Active Directory came on, um, that was limited to a single uh, authentication provider. Um, and then, you know, as we, we pr- progressed, we were able to add in more and more and also be able to have um, more than one authentication provider. Um, so I'd just like to uh, go through some tips and tricks because I had a customer who got in touch um, this week and it is something I see fairly regularly um, and they had accidentally locked themselves out of their own um, instance of Octopus. Um, so just really want to, do some tips and tricks. Make sure that you know, we can try and avoid that. Uh, avoid that. In this instance, um, they were going from Azure Active Directory to Google Apps, um, and the first thing I would do, uh, the first thing I would do here is recommend is you you back up, um, back up your Octopus instance, um, and test. I mean, common sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and really, here is is, is you can. You can configure it um, under configuration and settings. Um, and you can, like I was saying earlier on, you can have more than one authentication provider. So, for instance, um, you can come into Google Apps uh, and just select it that it's enabled here. That's it. You know, it's straightforward enough. You've got your client ID, which is not here just now uh, for security reasons. Uh, but that is really it, that you can just enable your Google Apps um, obviously, there'll be a, a, some configuration there, and I recommend checking out our documentation on how how to do that. So one of the thing. Oh, yeah. Go oh, for it. I was going to ask. So, so you this question started with someone who had locked themselves out of their server. Is how do we get back? It's like if that happens, say like I I'm overzealous. I turn on Google Apps and then I disable username and password, and then all of a sudden I can't log in because I didn't. I forgot my client ID. Yeah. Firstly, it will normally uh, tell you. It will normally give you a warning saying no authentication providers configured. That would you know a bit of a giveaway there. And then 
Also, there's a, a useful page on our, on our site that will take you through. You can get someone, if you don't have um, access to the Octopus server, you can RDP in um, and then just re-enable it. It's really straightforward. And these five commands here, um, you know, you just flick them between true and false, um, and it's really that straightforward. So if you do find that um, you have locked it out and you have been a little bit overzealous, uh, Ryan, uh, then yeah, drop in, you know, enable it, and then that's it. But at the same time, as if it, you know, if it does go really uh, pear shaped, you have your SQL backup as well. Um, yeah. Now, can you can so uh, you can have multiple authentication providers configured? Can you tie the same user account Octopus deploy to multiple authentication providers like so I can use the same account like that? Great question, Bob. Great question. Yes, you can. Um, okay. What you can do is, um, for instance, is um, here, I actually have. Um, you know, I, as a fan of automation, I, you know, I have a domain controller in my home. Mm -hmm. um, here I am, you know, and I've got my, this is my username, um, Derek at home. Uh, as you can see, I'm really creative with um, <laughs> the conventions. In addition to that, obviously, we have uh, uh, Google Apps here. And, and as, you know, you can uh, use your email address. In this instance, it would actually use, um, you could have that. But yeah, you can have multiple authentication providers tied to the same user. And that's where it's really flexible. And, and it does have fallbacks as well, where it tries to look up things like email addresses and so forth. There are a few little um, issues there. But what I would do is, um, is just ensure, um, where possible, try and keep the same naming conventions for your usernames and passwords. Um, and where possible, try and avoid using um, the same email address um, for different accounts. Like quite often oh. we see non-admin accounts and administrator accounts, and then they have their email address at the same. There are some, you know, occasionally there's some issues there. So where possible, try and use unique identifiers there. Would you still have a uh, separate admin account that just has the username and password? It's not tied to any external providers. That's a really good question. Yes, that's a really good tip as well. Uh, what we definitely recommend, you know, similar to you know, you, you can actually have that. I'd imagine security might come up and give you a little bit into trouble for having local usernames and passwords. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what I definitely recommend it. You can have the username and password uh, in the local um, in the local DB. But you can just disable it. So it, you, it, what you can do is create an admin account. It's your recovery account. Um, that's a really good question, a really good tip to do, actually. Um, so, yeah, you can do that. And you, you don't have to link them to authentication providers, so you can disable Google Apps, Azure Active Directory, and so forth, and just have it local. Yeah. yeah hopefully you don't run into this too often. I mean, hopefully you're not swapping your authentication providers every day, but... Yeah. When you do and you accidentally lock yourself out, like you said, like that customer, I imagine it wasn't a great day for them because everyone sees yeah. probably CICD pipeline started suddenly failing. Like, oh my gosh. It wasn't great, but thankfully um, we, we got them back up and running pretty quickly and, and there was no real major issue, thankfully. But hey, That's good. just back, back up and test. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. That's it. I'll hand you over to Ryan. All right. Let me switch over. All right. So yeah, like Bob, I had a question where, you know, somebody asked me something I had never tried to do before. I'm like, I'm pretty sure we can do that. Uh, our audit logs are, are pretty good, but let me go in exactly and find the, the right filters, the right steps. So the question came out was uh, a customer says, Hey, I was looking for this specific release and I couldn't find it. How do I find out if it was deleted, who deleted it and go from there? Uh, Derek, Bob, y'all ever look for like a missing release or a missing uh, other item in Octopus? It's been a while. Yeah, I typically have my I have my retention policies configured pretty strict, like in dev and test. And if my retention policy deletes a release, I just assume I don't care about it anymore. Uh, but you know, to say production, probably care about it a little bit more, uh, especially if it just suddenly goes away. They might have some questions. Yeah, exactly. And releases are kind of a special case, which is what made this question a little more interesting mm -hmm. uh, because it can be deleted. Like you mentioned, retention policies, packages are the same way they can be cleaned up by retention policies. So there's really multiple avenues for them to be deleted. Uh, but so I've come into our audit screen and I've opened the advanced filters. So if you want to see if anything has been deleted, you can choose the event category, which there are many event categories for you to choose from. But the one where we would look for first is document deleted. 
Now, everything within Octopus is a document. Your project's a document, your user account's a document, your releases and deployments are documents. So by selecting document deleted, it's gonna show anytime anything was deleted. So you see Bob's been just trashing our deployment targets all over the place. Yeah. Now, was that done, because uh, everything's a document, is that a holdover from our Raven DB days, do you think? Yeah, most likely. Uh, Octopus, historically, the first few versions used RavenDB, which is a document database. Uh, so everything was stored as documents. And even when we transitioned to SQL Server, we still kept the document database kind of uh, paradigm within, even within SQL Server, things are stored as documents. Ah, that makes sense. Uh, but we're looking specifically, we see like Bob's deleting all our deployment targets. We're looking specifically for releases. So that's where the document types filter comes in. So you can actually see what all the documents are, uh, what are considered documents within the database. Uh, and we're going to grab release. And now that we've selected document deleted and the release document type, you can see I've manually deleted some releases. Uh, so you can see that information if we expand that out, you can actually, oh, that's nice. You can actually see the uh, the actual document that was deleted. Because I know if you click on the link where you expect this would take you to the release, it'll just tell you this resource has been deleted. Oh, that's so that is nice. What, you can able to see that. Yeah, yeah it's like I, this is the first time I've actually expanded that document <laughs> deleted thing. So learn something today. Check. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Now, what you may notice, and, and since you've already mentioned it, uh, retention policies, they delete releases, but I don't see any of those events here. And that is a different uh, event category. So those are actually separate from document deletes. They have their own event category. So we scroll all the way to the bottom. We'll see, you'll see the package one. So you see package deleted. Uh, but you also see release deleted by retention policy. And once we select that, then you'll see all of the systems, uh, system delete events for your retention policies. So you can search through the manual deletes and then search through your retention policy deletes and then find out why a specific release is meant, missing. Okay, I felt, I mean, it's, that's showing me everything. OctoFX, cloud formation, random quotes. Can I filter that by project so I can just... Yeah, so you can filter, I think in general, anything that's highlighted uh, mm -hmm. or linked in the event description, you can filter by. So if we come into the projects and choose uh, OctoFX, like it's gonna filter down to those. Oh, nice. Yeah, so any so then you could sort through, okay, well, we, I, we know it was this project, I was looking for a release in this project. We scroll down and see, oh yes, it was cleaned up because of this. And then, just make a decision there. Did you? Does it make sense for it to be cleaned up by the retention policy? Are your retention policies too uh, lax? Or I mean, I may be too strict. Do you need to go and say, oh, for production, we want to keep six months or a year or mm -hmm. indefinitely, if that's the case. But yeah, it gives you a little, you can at least find out, was it, oh, I need to go yell at Ryan because he manually deleted <laughs> this mm -hmm. uh, deployment. <laughs> or I was like, oh, I need to go yell at Ryan because he said our <laughs> retention policy is too strict. Either way, it comes down to being my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one that's doing the demo, so I imagine you're the one that's configured it, so that's why your name's popping up. <laughs> exactly. Cool. Yeah, so that's it. So, yeah, the audit uh, screen, very, very useful. Like, everything's going to be logged here, and the events filters can help you find exactly what you're looking for, whether it's a, a project change, a deployment, who deployed to production, or, you know, why is this release missing? Very nice. All right. So well, with that, we'll uh, end the episode for the day. So if you have an interesting question, uh, send it to us. You know, send us an email on Slack. Uh, send it to support at octopus.com or leave it as a comment on the video. So thanks again. Thanks for your, uh, your answers, Bob and Derek. Yeah, thank Excellent. you. Everyone have a great day. Yeah. Until next time.